Hello, agentpreneurs, and welcome to episode 42 of the Daily List Report. We are in week nine of this amazing labor of love for all of us here at List Reports, and we hope that you're enjoying this content. Um, across all of our platforms, we just passed 2,000 hours of consumed content, which is really exciting. So I think that's a sign that you're enjoying what you're seeing. We're coming off an amazing week last week with Stand and Salute Extreme Ownership. As always, the episodes are posted in full on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, search for The Daily List Report, and you're going to find access to all of our previous episodes. And so make sure you do that. If you like the content, definitely subscribe. In fact, one of our most popular episodes ever was with a gentleman named Omri Friedel, our very own head of finance. And he came on and he talked about the Paycheck Protection Program to make sure that all of you could take advantage of it, get access to that capital, and share. We were able to share some of our learnings in going through that process. So I'm really excited because Omri is back on the show with us today. And Omri is going to give an update on all things PPP. And so with that, I'm actually going to bring Omri on the screen right now. Omri, say hello to the agentpreneurs of List Reports. Hello, everyone. Happy to be back and great to see everyone again. Omri, thank you for doing this. I, you've got a, a, a lot on your plate all day, every day. And I... You know, you have such a big heart for this, right? You've jumped at the chance, frankly, I think, you know, to be able to share these learnings with others so that they can hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls that we've experienced along the way. And you've done a great job, I think, of summarizing all of this information. So I can't thank you enough on behalf of all of our agents out there for doing this. So thank you. Well, I'm happy to do it. I really hope this is helpful and people can glean some information and some value from it. As always, if anybody needs to reach out either through the posting itself or through LinkedIn, we're happy to, to help in any way we can. And as I said, I really hope this is helpful to people and that they can use it and um, survive through this whole process and improve their businesses. I think that's absolutely the case. There's no question there's a tremendous amount of value here, Omri. Um, so what we're going to do is you know, Omri is going to go through um, some high level uh, around the updates to the program and a bunch of stuff. He has a presentation. We're going to have the presentation up as well. There's a lot of content in that presentation. We're not going to go through everything, but that presentation is going to be posted in the comments and the description. Okay, So make sure you click on that. Feel free to share it with anybody that you want. Um, and don't worry that you're missing some of the details on that as Omri is talking. You're going to have access to that later. What he wants to make sure that you understand is the high level concepts on each one of those slides. Does that sound good, Omri? That's perfect. Exactly what I was going to lead in with. It's a lot of information. Not going to go through it as that will take a long time. Just really the goal is to simplify what looks like a really big application process and hope that we can uh, help everyone on the next step of the PPP process. Fantastic. All right, Omri, with that, I'm going to take a step back and I have you and your presentation up on screen and you're good to go. All right. So what's happened since? It's been about four or five weeks since I was on last. Um, as you know, a second tranche was approved for the PPP and it raised the total amount of money to $659 billion. As of just under two weeks ago, 513 of those have been approved by the SBA. That's straight off the SBA website and it's across 4.3 million loans, which is a lot of loan. It's a lot of volume. What it also means, though, is there's still money out there. So if you haven't had a chance or you haven't had a need or you weren't sure if you do need it, by all means, you still have until June 30th to apply for a loan. And if you do find that you need to take that time and, and put in that application. Um, one thing we did notice over the second tranche is the actual average loan size has decreased. As I think the bigger players have gotten out of the way. Um, so again, if you need the money, by all means apply. You have until June 30th to do so. Since then also, you must have heard there's been a lot of noise around pretty big companies getting pretty large checks. I think a couple of the chain restaurants were the big famous ones, but there have been a few others that I've heard of. And they've a lot of them have since returned the money. But what that clarified for everyone is just because you want a loan doesn't mean you need it and doesn't mean you deserve it. So regulators came out that you actually really need to have a need for the loan in order to apply for it and keep the money. When you do apply, any borrower needs to certify that the current economic conditions make the loan request necessary. Again, that's a need. And you do certify that in good faith. And why people have, have returned the money is they realize they did not really need the loan, be it they had access to other capital or their economic condition wasn't so dire. So if you're going to apply, make sure you have an actual need as that's what's going to get looked at. 
And if you don't have a need and they find that out, you actually are on the hook for the whole thing and have to return it. It's not a repayment plan at that point in time. On the good side of things, a lot of us were very afraid of getting audited because frankly, getting audited is never fun. I've been on the other side of performing audits. It's not fun on either side, but it's certainly not fun if you're the one being audited. Um, what the regulators have deemed, a lot of it is through the volume. As you've seen, there's 4.3 million loans that have been granted. They've deemed that any loan under 2 million ordered of actual or to have an audit won't occur. But it means if you receive the loan, chances are you won't have an audit. If the loan over 2 million, chances are you will get audited. So make sure you have all your information in an accurate place and we go through that in a little bit, but that's really good news for anybody getting what is a smaller loan amount. It would make your burden subsequently easier and should make the burden for forgiveness a lot easier as well. Also, there've been a significant amount of discussions on what would loan forgiveness look like, which is really the core of what this deck and what this information here is going to represent. We really wanna go through all of that and explain now that the actual loan forgiveness application is out, what that would look like and what is the process you have to go through. I put in a link at the bottom right here that has access to a lot of information on the S on the SBA website, be it application forms, other information that you can access and source. So let's assume you've received funding. So first of all, congratulations. That's great. That's helpful for your business, your employees, the economy as a whole. But eight weeks or so after receiving the funding and at some point thereafter, you're going to actually have to apply and want to apply for forgiveness. So what do you need to do in order to make sure that application as a whole is successful? First of all, you have to spend it appropriately. We went through this in the last deck. This loan is to cover very specific costs. It's payroll costs for eight weeks or 56 days. That's a defined term and you can find that in Appendix A of this deck as well as the last one. Mortgage interest, rent, utilities for agreements that have been in place since February 15th. So if you entered into a lease after that, it will not count. You need to have had that lease in place ahead of that. Similarly, any interest on the debt. And just remember, 75% of the loan proceeds are to be used for payroll costs. So if you have no payroll costs, you can't necessarily borrow against not having those. So make sure that you have those costs in order to repay them. 25%, of course, can then be used for other costs. Next, you have to track your expenses. No one's going to come and check if you did it, but the, the better you track your expenses, the easier it is for you to actually submit the application that we'll go through shortly and just to track everything and still, you still might get audited just to be able to support, provide supporting materials for the audit. And lastly, when it's time, complete the application. I'll emphasize this a few times. There's no rush to complete the application. The application is due October 31st, 2020, which is in a while. And in some situations, it may be advantageous for you to actually apply after June 30th. June 30th is an important date as that's a date by which you can return all your payroll and full-time employee levels to what they were prior to the COVID outbreak. So you can apply as soon as your eight weeks are up, or you can wait a little bit, as long as you apply before October 31st. I put in a link for the application at the bottom in case anybody has yet to receive it or can't find it. It's available in the previous link, but also directly on this link. So the application form itself. Now the application form seems like it's a really big thing and here is where the deck is gonna get very detailed. It is a total of 11 pages. And considering the original loan application was two pages, this seems like a lot. But don't let that worry you. The majority of there is just information to actually help you out and make things a lot easier. And there are three broad components to this application. The actual loan forgiveness calculation, which is pages three and four, a Schedule A to support that loan forgiveness calculation, which is page six, and a worksheet to support Schedule A. There's going to be a lot of references to lines and numbers and boxes, but they're all specific to each of these schedules. And very importantly, the instructions are in the form ahead of each uh, section. So you read the instructions, then you see the form. The most amusing thing is you're actually going to end up completing this in reverse. You need to complete Schedule A worksheet in order to complete the Schedule A in order to actually do the calculation. The end of the form, last page, page 10, indicates what actually must be submitted and what you need to maintain. There's two distinctions here. Maintain is all the records that we've been referring to of track everything, have supporting documentation. Submit is really the only two things that have to go in with the submission for forgiveness. 
Two big things to submit is the actual forgiveness calculation and the Schedule A for that forgiveness calculation, as well as the obvious supporting materials that you'd use to support any costs. Could be your leases, it could be the payroll you've incurred, it could be the amount of employees you've had, and a lot of it comes out as you slowly and steadily complete that application. What you need to maintain is just the records, any of the real background detail at an employee by employee level, previous application information you may have kept. So it looks long, but it's really... So how do you start it? The first thing you're actually gonna to have to do is your Schedule A worksheet. There's two tables in there, there's a lot of information in there, but it essentially does one very simple thing. It goes through employee by employee and calculates how much cash has been paid to those employees over your period of eight weeks that you'll define and we'll explain what that definition is. And then if necessary, it calculates whether a reduction has taken place. And it goes through step by step and I laid out all the steps here, but as we alluded to earlier, we're not necessarily gonna go through every one of these things. But the crux of this is how much cash did you pay your employees specifically for payroll? Did the employee stay in Are they still a full-time employee? And did they incur any reductions that have been greater than 25%? As you'll go through the different steps, you'll notice that, hey, we've only put in a 5% discount. That still means your actual reduction for the purposes of forgiveness is zero. Or one of my employees left and another came up. That's okay. You actually replace that employee. It means you're a change of zero. So your average FTEs are the same. You'll notice a little bit later on through the application, they ask you for total FTEs. That's different than how the calculation works. The calculation looks at the average over a period of time. Should you actually have had any sort of reduction in the workforce or big reductions, they may reduce your total forgivable amount. They won't actually prevent any forgiveness in, as a whole. It just might reduce how much can be forgiven. And there's also certain things that are allowed. If you've had to furlough an employee, but then gave them an offer and they rejected it, that's an exception that will not impact the amount that is forgiven. If you've had someone that you've had to terminate for cause, call it normal course of business, again, that is an, an acceptable um, exception and you will not be, your forgiveness will not be impacted by that. If an employee has decided to resign, again, normal course of business, your forgiveness will not be impacted by that. So the regulators have taken into consideration what is normal course of business to make this an acceptable aspect and not just say, oh, you started with 40 people, now you have 35 because five quit, we'll punish you. It's not gonna work that way. It's only if you're unable to return back to normal levels. Lastly, there's a broad context of safe harbor, meaning have you actually just overridden all of this stuff? If you've kept the same number of employees as a whole and for the periods in question, then really you're not gonna have any reduction from an FTE perspective. You're certainly going to get an actual clean number one. It's going to go on the front of the application as you go through it. And it means that regardless of everything that has occurred, you're going to get the amount forgiven subject to anything else that's occurred. So some items to consider here. Again, you have until June 30th to restore salary levels or FTEs. The application itself goes through that. It will compare your salary levels or payroll levels and FTE levels today compared to where it was when you originally applied for the loan or it will give you the option to look at that as of June 30th, which is why earlier we alluded to, you don't need to apply until June 30th or even after. The worksheet is employee by employee, but you're submitting in aggregate for everyone. That's why actually when you submit the information, it's just a total sum. So if somebody leaves and somebody's rehired, that's still okay. Tables one and two in that worksheet are actually the same, just one deals with employees that are lower paid compared to the others. And lastly, the boxes are marked one through five in that worksheet. They feed right into the next part of the application, which is where we're going to next. The PPP Schedule A, the next part of the application, it's on page six. Very easy. You're carrying over information from table one and table two right into the lines that are indicated. And here you enter also the non-cash payroll costs. Previously, it was how much salary or cash compensation we as an employee may have received. This also brings into in the equation, the employer contributions for health insurance, employee retirement plans, state and local taxes, all the allowed expenses under the regulation. If you're self-employed, this is where you're gonna find owner compensation. So if you're applied as your self-proprietor, you would put that information in here. 
note, you cannot put it in both places. So you can't say, oh, I've paid myself as part of this worksheet and I've paid myself as part of line here, part of line nine here. And note that the amount is capped at $15,385. That's very straight math. $100,000 a year is the cap divided by 52 weeks for a month for a weekly amount times eight for the eight weeks amount or the 56 days. The other part of Schedule A is just some basic math. Line 10, what are your total payroll costs? Line 11 through 13 is word or any FTA reductions. I, I, line 13 is a big number. There's just one, one at all the safe harbors. Nothing has changed. Multiplying your total payroll cost by that number. So the closer it is to one, the better. Ideally, it's at one. It can't go higher since you, even if you've gone above and beyond your FTE count, then uh, that calls other things into question, but you're not going to get more than what you've borrowed for given. And another key item to note, a bunch of these lines from here will carry over to the next actual calculation of the amount that can be forgiven. So line 10 feeds into line one, line three feeds into line five, and line 13 feeds into line seven. It's very easy and much better to review this in conjunction with the actual application, which is why I pulled a lot of this information out so you don't have to scroll up and down across the different pages. And the last part is the actual forgiveness calculation itself. It's on page three. The instructions are on the two uh, pages ahead of that. And it's the final step. So all the information you've used in the worksheet to feed into Schedule A, now we're using Schedule A to feed into this calculation. Key items to note, the top part is very easy. Your business, tax identifying information, how much did you borrow? What are your number of employees before and after? Very, very basic information. The key items, was your loan $2 million? Make sure you check or do not check the box because this is gonna drive whether or not you're gonna get extra scrutiny by the regulators. What is the covered period or alternate covered period? A lot of questions around, when is my covered period? If I received my loan today, my payroll is in two weeks, how does that actually work? These two sections will explain that. It will define whether you're gonna start the day right, the day right after you receive the loan, which is the covered period, or you can elect an alternate covered period, meaning, hey, my payroll is, is every two weeks. It's very often. Can I start in another week or two? And the answer is yes, you can, as long as you're consistent in all your calculations throughout the application. Another item to note, there will be proration around the eligible payroll costs. It's a defined term in that application. Make sure you read it carefully, but it will discuss how anything that has been dispersed or may be dispersed in the next payroll period may actually will be included as part of the forgiveness calculation meaning your forgiveness ended today, but payroll is only dispersed in three days. As long as payroll is dispersed in those three days, you still will be able to count that as part of your calculation. The rest is very simple inputs. I'm not gonna go through line by line and explain what each of them are. They're all laid out here, but you're picking them up off the other lines, doing a quick summation and subtraction in case you had anything that is a reduction, and then putting in that quotient that hopefully is 1.0 in terms of how many FTEs you've had left. And lastly, you're gonna to get to the potential forgiveness amount. So even after you've done all this math, there's a three options as what your forgiveness amount will be. The first, line is, the first line is the modified total, which is your total cost you've incurred times that FTE reduction quotient. Hopefully again, that's at 1.0. The second option is your total amount. That's the maximum you can get forgiven. If you've borrowed $500,000, they will not forgive you more than $500,000. And the last one is your payroll cost. And this is where they're looking at, did your payroll cost exceed or, or was less than the 75% at which point they will lower how much is forgiven. You take the total payroll cost divided by 0.75, which means that number should go up. And hopefully the line nine becomes the smallest number in here. And hence your entire payroll line is forgiven. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of data in here. Make sure you read it through, go line by line. I've pulled out the salient points out of all the instructions that you've had there and put them out here so you can refer to this and the application at the same time. A few other items to note that for, from my perspective as I looked at this and went through it are, this is only math and it's math and records you have. So it's really not that complicated, even though there's a bunch of steps and if then scenarios, you're really looking at how much have I paid my employees? How does that compare back to how much I paid them earlier this year before I filed for the loan? 
And to the extent those two things are matching, you're good. If there's been some reduction, it might mean your total forgivable amount has reduced. Or if your FTEs have reduced slightly for other reasons that are not normal course of business, then you might have, you might have a reduction in your forgiveness. The worksheet is for guidance. I know that looks like a really long worksheet. A lot of payroll systems, and I kind of joke here, they may or should have. Payroll systems are like all systems. They sound great until you actually try to use them. They have their own little finickiness. All of that information. Second, you have time. Don't rush this. Itself, deadline is October 31st, 2020, which is quite a few months away. And again, June 30th is a key date that may change how you submit this application. Please apply for forgiveness after June 30th. Lastly, you don't have to worry about payments. You're not going to have to pay this back for at least six months. So you're in no rush. Also, you're not alone. We went through this last time. Ask questions to get clarity of everyone and anyone until you understand what you need to understand. That's the most important thing. Have your trusted colleagues, advisors, consultants review and check for accuracy. Don't be shy to ask questions. We're happy to help and go through it. And I guarantee you, anybody you'll ask will be really happy to help for you to go through it. Contact your bank. We've all had a great experience with the bank here, and I say the word great loosely. I think the banks have gotten a bit better over the second tranche, but I'm 100% sure the banks are going to create their own process and tools to go through this stuff. So just like when you submitted the application for the loan, each bank was a bit different. They took that application form and tried to make it more electronic and more smart. They're probably going to do the same thing, and they will dedicate resources to help you go through this. So make sure you contact your bank ahead of doing anything and understand their process. And lastly, focus what, on what you can control. And this is actually something that you can control. as the, the application itself you can control. If your total FTE count has reduced or you've needed to maintain the reductions in payroll, sell a V. You can't control or change that. The worst that happens is a component of your loan is not forgiven. And then you have a 1% loan that's payable over a very favorable term. It's not the end of the world. Uh, so that, that's all I have for today. Honestly, I hope you find this insightful and helpful. As Randy said, we're going to post it up with the comments and the description of the videos. And if anybody needs help, please reach out via comments, via LinkedIn, or in whatever other manner you can find. And we'll be happy to, to help you in whatever way we can. Omri, thank you for doing that. Um, it's actually quite a bit of work just to put all of this together and you've given, I think, a lot of clarity to it. I actually love your parting thoughts. I think that gives a lot of reassurance as well. I have a couple questions for you, Omri, if you don't mind. Um, of course. You know, one, if you're listening to this right now and you're an agent out there, either a sole proprietor or a small team, um, you know, you said, look, you're not alone, right? There's lots of people you can ask questions to. Should they be taking this information to their CPA? Should the CPA be preparing this for them? Or where should they go for sort of very tactical guidance around completing these forms? I think there are a few options. CPAs should certainly be able to help. I don't necessarily know if they should be preparing this. A lot of CPAs focus more on the taxes, but they should have a clarity on the regulations. Certainly, if they use any bookkeeping services or outsource payroll services, those should certainly be able to help. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly, any legal counsel would be helpful, and all real estate agents have lawyers and no lawyers. Now, they might be real estate lawyers, but lawyers know other lawyers. It's one thing lawyers are really good at. So That's very true. they will be able to find some sources and help you out. Uh, you have other friends who are going through this. You have clients who are probably entrepreneurs and you have a network. Use that network and use those relationships, just like you've helped them find homes and helped them sell homes. They have professionals and they can help you in some capacity. And that's what we did. We reached out to a bunch of people across the board, both our legal counsel, our CPAs, and just connections from past lives. Somebody in there will have people that are learning how to do this. I know the big accounting firms are trying to put software together to help test the stuff out and, and do it more automatically. And the one I mentioned in here is your bank. The bank at the end is responsible for doing this. And they've now had quite a while, at least eight weeks to get ready for this. So they should yes. be able to help you out as well. That's great. That's great. Um, Omri, you know, the first, the first allocation of money, the first, I think it was 350 billion, I mean, that went in, what, two weeks? I mean, it was gone. Right? Very quick. 
And, you know, there was the second allocation and now we're, we're sort of, you know, a month plus into that and it still hasn't been exhausted. What do you, what do you make of that? A couple of things. I, I think the first allocation, my guess is a lot of the banks favored some of the bigger clients and a lot of the bigger money went out very quickly. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that got a lot of bad press and it changed the way the, the process worked. I think the second tranche was much more directed at smaller businesses, really small businesses that needed the funds. Yes. We've seen the average loan size drop substantially. I don't offhand remember, but I believe it's it's down into the low hundreds of higher before, but we can, no, the, we can look and... Yeah, I, I mean, I could be wrong this year as well, but directionally, I think the average uh, in the first wave was north of 200,000, and now it's way below 100,000. It's like 40 or 50,000, right? Correct. That, that's where I think it went. So I think it really decreased, which means the quantum of loans may have increased, mm-hmm. but the size of each loan has decreased. Yes. Um, and perhaps maybe the government got it a little bit right on the total volume of, of dollars they, they allocated. That's what I was thinking, right? Which is and maybe surprising, but yeah, maybe them so. if that, that occurred. Um, there's also a component of that funding that, that's going to actually support the process itself. That's one thing that's overlooked and I've always wondered. One of my curiosities has been, we've had a massive number of unemployment claims, right? There's 30 plus million people. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that 30 million, there are people who are able to design a process to make this work, who are able to get on the phone and facilitate support. Yes. And we tried to get on the phone with both the banks and the SBA and nobody picked up. I think we had a a call center offshore that picked up at some point. Mm -hmm. I was always curious how is it that 30 million people are unemployed, but nobody is Nobody's there to answer directing that workforce into this effort because yeah. the funding is there yeah. and, and the ability is there. So, so I think it's a combination of loan size, business size, uh, the allocation really specific to smaller banks um, and people that kind of thought, hey, this would be a great idea to get this money when I don't need it. So the regulations around having a clear need may have created some second thoughts in some people who would have applied for it otherwise. Well, that was part of it, right? There was a congressional hearing just last week, and one of the, I don't remember who it was, but one of the points made by, I think it was a senator, was, look, a lot of people held back after that first wave and are not getting it because the repayment wasn't clear enough to them, right? And there's been a lot of discussion, frankly, about restructuring the repayments of this and maybe changing the allocation of the 75% to payroll because there's a lot of businesses that have high overhead, right, as a percentage of their overall spend. And so, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, you'll be on again, probably talking about the shifts and the changes to this program that I think, frankly, are pending, right? I think we'll see a lot of changes. I think the total CARES Act is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of other nuances to come. We touched on it last time we spoke on all the other aspects in the CARES Act beyond just this loan program. And all of those are still regulations that were quickly put in place and a lot of changes to come. Yeah. Be it for taxation, whether you got this or didn't get this and how the repayment. Forgiveness is just starting out. We're just eight weeks into this. Yes. We still have until June 30th to go. So the forgiveness volume will probably increase in four weeks and subsequent, which is why we wanted to get on, get on now and get a little bit ahead of this. But I think you're right. I think in... Four to six more weeks, we'll learn a little bit more and see how this progresses and and go back and continue our discussion on this stuff. Absolutely. Omri, thank you again. Uh, And again, on behalf of everyone watching, thank you for taking the time to put this together. Again, this entire presentation is going to be in the description and in the comments. Feel free to share it with anybody, right? This is is our effort to make sure that everybody's aware and informed, right, Omri? Absolutely. And again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Happy to interact and any as I can guide you to where, where I think you can get the answers. That's wonderful. All right, Omri. Thank you so much, Omri, for joining us today. I'm sure we'll see you probably in another few weeks with another update. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. Absolutely. All right. Um,
Well, that's great, right? There's, uh, I don't know, 15 slides here of a tremendous amount of really great practical information. So make sure that you use this, you, you reach out to people. Again, you're not alone, right? You have time to figure this out. So I think the Omri's parting words were, were really great. So again, this will be posted in the comments. Make sure you get access to that. Uh, you share that with anybody. Um, thank you for joining today. Tomorrow, we've got Ryan Terigner on. We're gonna talk about List Reports Live. It's another product training and show you how to get the most about uh, out of our virtual products. On Thursday, we've got Eric Mitchell coming on. He's gonna talk about the latest in the mortgage market. There's so much going on with forbearance and um, you know non-QM loans coming back and jumbos and there's just a whole Whole bunch of stuff happening so he's going to give an update and then on friday my co-host from last week with saul will be on and we're going to give a really nice recap of last week's episodes for stand and salute extreme ownership so we're going to condense an entire week of shows down into one really nice show with all of the best bits from that so until then be safe be happy be healthy please please be happy and have fun and make sure that you're adopting all of these great tools and technologies and utilizing this great content and until then we'll see you tomorrow